Hi everyone, welcome to episode 11 of BCG's Health Tech Videos. I am Arielle Rothman, and today's moderator is Krishna Srikumar, Managing Director and Partner at BCG. Today's panelists are here to discuss scaling AI solutions for providers. I'm very excited to introduce our panelists. Mary Verghese Presti is the SVP and General Manager of Microsoft's Dragon Medical, and Suchi Saria is CEO and founder of Bayesian Health an AI professor at Johns Hopkins. Thank you both so much for joining. I'll pass it off to Krishna to begin the discussion. Thank you so much, Ariel. Mary and Suchi, welcome to the session. It is an honor and you know very exciting to have two formidable pioneers in the healthcare space here with us, sharing insights of what's happening within healthcare and pro in healthcare provider space, specifically around AI. I'll try to keep this as conversation as possible. I know all of you and both of you have a lot of insights to share in this space and what's happening, living in the trenches of, uh, of uh, many of these clinicians and, and nurses, et cetera. So to get started and right into it, the first topic that I wanted to cover was what we call as the jagged frontier of AI. Uh, you know, Gen AI, it has some astonishing capabilities. It can get a lot of things right very well, and it can get a lot of things wrong pretty quickly, right? It can write Shakespearean sonnet. On the other side, it cannot serve uh, or solve a wordle. Um, and so, you know, one of the questions that we typically face from our, our clients is, how should I think about Gen AI? Is Gen AI is the, is the main panacea for all things to do with solving for predictive problems in clinical and admin workflow space? And given all the problems with Gen AI, should I just start with the administrative workflows and ignore the clinical workflows? And maybe I'll start off with Suchi uh, in this, and then I'll turn it over to Mary. Sure. The most exciting advance is really all of the, the training in large data, structured and unstructured data, bringing it together to bring transparency, veracity, those underlying technologies that are the fundamental advances that's been made, repackaging it together, but for the applications with healthcare in mind. So for instance, what we're doing at Bayesian is really building uh, clinical co-pilot-like platforms, which are basically supporting frontline care teams. And what does that mean? That means they're pulling together data longitudinal, uh, longitudinal structured, unstructured, synthesizing it, creating trustworthy, clinically validated signals, much like you would expect a drug to look like, validated through a prospective trial and rigorous, and then moving it into a conversational, interactive, pilot like format that basically is now a, a new care team member, but they're very good at parsing millions of records. They're very good at not missing anything. They're very good at pulling the right information and making it available. They don't get tired at night. They're basically like finishing, closing gaps and doing what's needed to help you make the right thing the easy thing to do. Thank you, Suchi. Uh, Mary, your thoughts on those? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with so much what Suchi just said. In the, in the physician space, think about it as a really great intern right? Sourcing a lot of information and pulling it together, but the physician still has to make the decision. It's still the physician's judgment. Same thing with nursing. So we see it as it's augmenting. It's not replacing. It's not displacing. It's it's a co-pilot. It's not autopilot. Um, and, and again, I think that there is this transformation that's going to happen in healthcare. Um, and I, I mean, all of us, right? Like we, we've been releasing co-pilots in the Microsoft Office Suite Every day I learn a new prompt that helps me actually just make my day go a little bit easier. I'm fresh coming back from hymns and I put in, you know, tell me what I missed in the last two days, bulleted in table format on my action items. It's it's great. You know, it helps me. It, it's a starting point, like Suchi said, like here's something that I can start that's a little bit curated to get me going and make me a little bit more efficient that day. And I think as an industry, we're going to hone and hone and refine and we're going to learn together. Um, and it's exciting to see the different consortiums and you know, the inter interdisciplinary sort of forums coming together to figure out how do we hold hands and learn this together because we don't have all the all the answers. And for us, at least, um, we are starting more on the back end, on the administrative, on the, you know, what are the, what are the things we could do to wick away the work to reduce the repetitive and redundant documentation that happens in our healthcare system. Got it. I think very interesting. But one underlying theme that I picked up there was both, both Mary, you and Suchi, you are talking that AI, Gen AI is pretty much ready to go in the clinical workflow space. It's just not meant for the back office 
operation space, like the billing part of it, which is where, you know, one of the biggest myths of Gen AI is that it's not prime time ready to be uh, used within the clinical workforce, but it's better to be used in like revenue cycle management, et cetera. Seems like that is not the case, you know, it, very much we should be testing it out in the clinical workflow space. But two other threads came out from that. Uh, one is, I think, Suchi, you are hitting on the trustworthy, responsible part. Mary, you are talking about how it can help outcomes. And I want to push on both those threads, um, right? The first one is, uh, I think all of us in this room, we are familiar with fulfilling of the quadruple aim of uh, healthcare, right? Improving patient experience, improving provider experience, reducing costs and improving patient outcomes, right? Those are the four words. However, healthcare, as we know, is local and it needs to be personalized. And everyone does healthcare differently, physicians and nurses, et cetera. And probably that's one of the reasons why digital and AI has some roads to go before fulfilling the promise, because while we have digitized healthcare, we have not digitally transformed how health is delivered. Uh, so then the question is, how do we, how should providers best think about integrating AI um, and intermingling that with human expertise in transforming healthcare, right? Like, are there any success stories as well as failure stories that would serve as good uh, reminders for the audience here on how to think about this journey? And I'll, Mary, I'll start with you first on this one. Um, <clears throat> so I think that there is a lot you know, you you were saying earlier about you know people think it's only for the back end and it is for clinicians. I just want to clarify for us, there is there is a difference between um, a clinician using AI for productivity and workflow and a clinician using AI from a clinical decision making perspective, right? That those are two different things, but still in the clinician side. Um, I can give you an example, like basically you know, ambiently listening and generating the note based on what it heard for a physician to go back in and edit and be done with the note is very different from probing the AI to say, you know, tell me what differential diagnoses I might have missed, right? That's that's a different level. Yeah. Um, and I think that on the clin clinical side, um, we are still kind of looking through, and Suchi can probably speak to this much more, but, you know, we're really looking through, like, how do we do that in a way that is an assist, um, value add, um, but where we have some um, some validation that it's accurate and reliable without bias, that it's fair, it's inclusive, it's secure. Um, so there's another, you know, there's a number of facets there. When you're talking about clinical decision-making, it's just even more rigorous. I just wanted to, to just clarify that. Um, you're right, healthcare is extremely local. Um, there's also tremendous variability. So one of the things that I'm super excited about is, you know, making sure that we are providing the assist through AI for the ability to actually follow evidence-based guidelines. Um, we don't have a great percentage record of that. And it's, you know, it's very inconsistent. You'll get a different kind of care if you are in one part of the country as opposed to another, or even in the same geo, but in one setting versus another. And I think that that's a real opportunity for us because while the US has ultra high tech medicine, the provision of the care, as you mentioned, Krishna, there's so much you know, room to grow there. And at the end of the day, if you just think about a day in the life of a nurse or a day in the life of a physician, and this is where I'm focused, there's just some basic things that prevent them from being as productive as they can be so that they have the space and the ability to actually look at a patient, remove the keyboard between that physician and the patient and have an engaging uh, in, in interaction, right? Like there's so many things that we have the opportunity to remove to bring the patient and pa uh, physician face-to-face -face again. So I think that, you know, we're focused on kind of removing those hurdles so the physician is cleared up or the nurse is cleared up instead of like click, 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 like how many clicks does it take to get to the end, you know, end of an EHR that they can actually just speak their observations, but they can be hands-free and eyes-free in taking care of patients, which is what they want to do. And they're leaving, they're leaving the bedside in droves because the job of a nurse, the day-to-day -day job of a nurse is not what they went into the field to do. Um, I want to add to this, I often think of it as human machine teaming or expert machine, machine teaming. How can we create a teaming model such that they can work well together? An example of that is 
imagine today if someone came into me at my workplace and said, hey, um, this person's going to now make all these decisions for you. It's horrible. I don't know if I can trust them. I don't know. If... On the flip side, if I had a, somebody who was given to me as a teammate, they're doing a whole bunch of tasks for me, but then I can see I can give them more and more and more because they're competent. They're learning. That's a really good teaming model. And so the way we think about a lot of the clinical co-pilot work we're doing is rather than siloing them to one task, saying your job is to make sure you go listen to the narrative and write it down. Question is, can you build it in a way that you can parse longitudinal structure on structure data and then pull it together to understand the patient, forecast the journey, and then start training them in key moments, which are high value from a healthcare standpoint. Going back to your point of localization, to me, that is the most exciting opportunity. Historically, evidence-based practice has been all about, let me find 5,000 hypothetical humans that are representative of 300 million patients. And in those 5,000 patients, I will bring some experts together and come up with a good idea. And then we will make sure we reflect this across all 300 million patients. The reality is that 500,000 person set is not representative. So the ability to have AI learn with the right kind of oversight and end-to-end -end governance locally, and then bring all the expertise we have from other sides, but then also be able to identify when things are different and being able then in a supervised vision, put additional protocols that help you localize is just really, really exciting. Because now we go from, you know, one type of care for all, which is what like historically was variable, each man to his own. Then we went from there to the pendulum swing the other side, which is we want standardization. But standardization means it's not good for me, it's not good for you, it's not good for anybody, it's just good for some hypothetical average. So can we go back to pre pre precision care or personalization where really my data with millions of other people like me is being used to help me do the right thing, but then you know, can we really do it well? And doing it well means having an end-to-end -end governance and oversight in place so that you can trust the quality of the insights that are coming up. No, I think a lot of insights there. I think, Mary, I picked up you know, how do you better conform with uh, evidence-based guidelines while delivering in a localized manner? And then, Suchi, I think you talked about keeping an end-to-end -end workflow perspective versus just point-specific tasks that can be automated, right, to deliver the, the end outcome there um, across the quadruple lane. Um, I know, Ariel, we are running short on time. Maybe I'll ask just one question before, before the audience uh, takes their leave, right? Um, while both of you covered such rich insights, right, there are 6,000 or so hospitals, community hospitals out there of all type of settings, everyone coming with different type of, um, you know, uh, starting point, right? Maturity point, right? Regarding the data, regarding the infrastructure, regarding the kind of skills and expertise that they have. And you compound that with this whole talk about RAI and EU Act and EO Act, and it's, it's, it's all beginning to sort of simmer up to be overwhelming, right? What would be your maybe one nugget of advice, comforting advice that you would give back to the community, say that it's okay to get started. And it's actually a catalyst in some ways, right? To get started versus a deterrent here. Uh, maybe maybe I'll turn it to Mary first to you, if, if uh, you had some parting thoughts there. Yeah, I, I think it, part of it is just like recognizing where we are and recognize where we've been, right? So Yes, they're all uh, working through how to do this. And I think what's going to happen is we're going to have new roles and new titles that didn't exist before, right? And it was the same thing when ACOs, accountable care organizations, all of a sudden we had chief population health officers, right? Um, when we, you know, was at the beginning of the internet, we have chief digital officers. These these new roles and, and the offices that they represent evolve over time as we see that we have a need to have dedicated talent and capacity to can I examine these things on behalf of that institution. You know, we have roles now with gen generative AI where we have like prompt engineering, like that's going to be a field, right? So I think it's more just, we have to, we have to just have some grace that we all have to evolve as an industry, new roles, new offices, new policies, new, new standards. And, and we're still kind of early on when it comes to gen AI. So I think it's, it's going to come, I think we're getting faster each time with every new wave. Um, and whether we like it or not, the generative AI, because there is so much excitement, and as I mentioned earlier, like everyone is touching it, it's, I think it's going to be even more accelerated. There are two most, in, like two things that I found to be common things that people miss. The first one is actually super counterintuitive. People think clinical is high risk. It's actually quite the opposite. From a regulatory front, clinical is actually the most further along. And part of it is because of the FDA. We've had a very strong 
decade long standing approach to understanding how to govern the use of technology in clinical use. And that technology could be clinical AI, it could be, you know, other versions. To me, the departure from, you know, AI versus predictive analytics is not that big at all when it comes to how the FDA thinks about uh, rigor and quality. And you often think of it as, well, what is the application? What is the intended use? What is the intended population? And then what are the risks? What are the benefits? How are you going to measure the benefit? How, how do you measure the risks? How are you going to monitor it post deployment? And what's your risk mitigation strategy? So there's a very nice end to end framework in place and an approach to assessing it both before, during, and after. And so that means in it's actually kind of interesting to me, like that's the place where applications are actually, you know, much more thinking of it this way already and much more in a place where ideas that come out today are in tune with where policy is headed. On the flip side, a lot of AI that's been used in administrative use cases or other areas were kind of more like technology where regulatory was not as active. And so to me, the executive order was a lot about expanding oversight beyond sort of the classic use cases we are used to in interest healthcare to AI uses writ large. And so I think there's going to be a very interesting, you know, three year evolution here in terms of both what policies go in place and therefore how companies have to pivot. Thank you for that, uh, for that insight there. Um, I know we are running out of time, but I think I took a chock full of notes here. Hopefully the audience find uh, the insights very useful in their own journeys and uh, hope to have more such conversations. I had more questions to get through. We're just short of time here. But thank you again, uh, Mary and Sachi, for joining this conversation.